Hey everybody, Frank Spear back with you for another video. In this video, I want to try to put to rest once for all because it seems like I keep saying the same things and one of the leading proponents of the Israel Only Movement says he's watching these videos and yet he doesn't seem to ever address any of the points I make. It, it, it's, it's quite frustrating. It's like talking with somebody who says, hey, this car right here is blue. And you say, no, 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 excuse me. This car is red, and let me demonstrate that to you. So you put out 10 points, right? 10 proofs that the car is actually red. And the response from the other guy is, yeah, but the car is blue. And I already told you that, idiot. <laughs> That's kind of what happens here. It can be quite frustrating. Today, this guy made a video supposedly uh, dismantling an article that was written by another leading preterist who in this article tried to show that the Israel-only teaching is false uh, by using a particular verse or two in Romans chapter 11. But before this guy who made the video today tries to dismantle the argument of the other guy, I don't like naming names. I'm just not going to do it. But those of you who are following all of this, you'll know who's who. Before he does that, he regurgitates the same old four or five points that he uses to supposedly prove I.O. Israel only, that only Israel was saved in the first century and that relationship with the God of the Bible was closed off for anybody else since that time. He regurgitates the same arguments and then laughs about it as if they're ironclad, says, what don't these people get? Here it is. I just laid it out again. And yet I and others respond, and he acts as if there was never a response. And he just goes on and makes more videos saying the same thing over and over. The car is blue. The car is blue. The car is blue. When clearly it's red. So I want to address his top five points or so that he brings up in almost every video he makes. Every, he doesn't make videos, he makes audio teachings, but he puts them on YouTube. I think his uh, primary nail that he hammers over and over and over again is the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 and in Revelation chapter 14. These are the great multitude that come out of the tribulation from every tribe, nation, tongue, so forth. And he says, there you go. These were only Israelites. Only Israel was standing before the throne in heaven. Therefore, only Israel could be saved. And that's that. The gospel was over. They're the only ones standing there. They're singing the new song. That's the end because they're in heaven before the throne. There it is. What don't you people get? Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world, he says, and then the end would come. He quotes that passage over and over again. He says that's the end. They're standing there at the end in heaven. And this to him seems to be the end all be all. There it is. But when you show him repeatedly a couple of things that I'm going to say again here, he ignores them and then just calls you names. Um, listen to the videos for yourself. Listen to his teaching for yourself. The 144,000 were, in fact, Israelites. There's no question about that. Okay, 12,000 from the 12 tribes, a symbolic number representing that community of saints that came out of the persecution, meaning these were the ones that accepted Messiah out from Israel, both the diaspora Israelites, the 10 northern tribes scattered, as well as the Jews, those from the tribe of Judah, who had the temple system. Collectively, some came out and believed the gospel of Messiah, the gospel that a new kingdom was coming, and when it all went down in AD 70, those were the collective group that was left. Now, let me say a couple of things. One, they're not literally standing in heaven, literally. I've said this in other videos. The throne of God there is not literal because God does not have a literal body to sit his literal divine behind on a literal chair. 
This is symbolic language like the, almost the entirety of the rest of Book of Revelation. I've said it before, I'll just say it again quickly. If that, if that heaven is literal, a place in an invisible realm, and that chair, that throne is literal, and God has a literal body to sit on it, then the beast of Revelation is not the Roman Empire, but it's a literal monster of some sort. Then the locusts are not the Roman armies, but they're literal grasshopper, grasshopper type creatures. The lampstands are not the churches, right? But they are literal lights, candles, candelabras, candle stands, whatever you want to call it, right? If, uh, if um, then the stars, right, are not the leaders of the church, but they're literal planets in the heavens, literally, and on and on and on. That throne there is just symbolic language for the sphere of God's authority and rule. This guy also admits in some of his audio teachings, go back and listen to them, there's a lot to listen to, but he admits and will still say, of course, I never taught anything different. He'll say that foreigners, non-Israelites, could become part of the house of Israel by converting. But then he teaches, all of his teaching is based upon the fact, predicated upon the fact, that that didn't happen. He never really brings it up in his teachings. He says it in a phrase, oh yeah, yeah, they could be, but that ended in AD 70. Okay, but that still means they could be a part of it, right? That they could have been a part of those 144,000. And I want to talk about that in a minute, but I contend that the proselytes, the non-genetic ethnic Israelites that were God-fearers, converts to become followers of the God of Israel, were, would make up, would be included in the 144,000 because they were part of Israel when they converted. He says, oh yeah, they could convert, but they're not part of the 144,000. They're excluded. So they converted to Israel, but when it all went down in AD 70 and the redeemed came out of the tribulation, they weren't part of that. They just got left behind completely because they didn't have the blood of Abraham flowing through their veins. Let's see if that holds up scripturally. Go to Acts chapter 13 with me. Let's begin reading verse 14. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian, Antioch, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them saying, that is Paul, uh, on, he's on his missionary journey, sent to Paul and his companions here and said to them, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, the Israelites, then say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God. Listen to me. Now, let's stop right there for a second. Men of Israel is one group. That would include anyone who was a child of Abraham, right? Anyone who was an Israelite. Not just the Jews. Not just the diaspora from the ten northern tribes who may have come back to God and put themselves, you know, that got, they got circumcised. They came out from Samaria and living among the Gentiles out there in the Roman Empire. They, got, they said, you know what, I'm going back to the faith of my fathers. So they were circumcised and they came back and they're here in the synagogue. And so it's, it's the Jews and those people together would have been considered the men of Israel, right? Women weren't allowed in here. So men of Israel and another group, you who fear God, who are they? Those are the non-ethnic, right? They're not ethnic Israelites, but they're proselytes, converts to Judaism. Watch this. Then he goes on, he's preaching to them. Let's jump down here to verse 26. Then he says he addresses them again. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family. Who's that? Israel. Watch this. That would include the diaspora and the Jews. That would include Judah and the other tribes, right? All the tribes. Children of Abraham. Sons of Abraham. Yes, we all agree. So would this guy. Now watch this. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God. Who are they? 
Who are they? These are proselytes and converts, foreign peoples, non-Israelites who converted to belief in the God of Israel and became part of the house of Israel. Therefore, would not they have been included in the 144,000, that symbolic number, of all those Israelites who would be saved out from the old covenant system when it was destroyed? Of course, that is who this is referring to. And this guy says, oh yeah, that, that happened, but they weren't really part of Israel when it comes to the 144,000 who came out of the Great Tribulation. What? Why? Where's your proof for that? They got left behind? They were kicked out then and said, well, you're not really a part of Israel, so you're not included here. Of course not. Cornelius was a God-fearer. He was a Roman, an Italian guy. They say, oh no, he was a Jew, or he was an Israelite, but they, they really have no substantial, legitimate uh, proof for that. They work it in. They try to make it work. But he was a convert, a proselyte. That's why when Peter comes to him and says, I'm preaching the same word to you as we preach to the Israelites, Cornelius understood it. That's why he was praying to the God of Israel. That's why the God of Israel answered him, because he was part of Israel. He converted to Israel. Okay? And so this 144,000 are all of the Israelites, including proselytes, converts, that would have put their faith in Messiah Jesus before the end of the Old Covenant system was, before that end of the Old Covenant system came. Then the new kingdom arrived. That's why they're before the throne. They're seated in the new heavenly places. It's the new kingdom, the new place of God's rule and authority. It's the marriage covenant, right? It's Revelation 21 and 22. It's the adoption of sons. It's the whole creation was groaning, awaiting this thing. And the 144,000, symbolically, those Israelites who made it out, who escaped, who were rescued, who were saved, by that gospel of the kingdom that was to come, that went out to them. They said, oh, something else is coming? The old is going to end and there'll be something new instituted? Yeah, I want to be a part of that. Most of Israelites said, there's nothing new coming. This is heresy. And they perished in the destruction of the old covenant system. But those who did put their faith in the Messiah, who were persecuted for doing so, we're under that tribulation for doing so. Those are the 144,000 we see. And yes, they were from every tribe, nation, tongue, so forth. They were that great multitude because they were living all over the Roman Empire and they came home to God so that they would be prepared for this new kingdom when it arrived. It's not difficult. But for some reason, this guy just has blinders on. He won't see that. He'll say that the foreigners could join, but then he teaches as if they couldn't. And then when he listens to this, if he listens to it, he'll just call me names and say that I'm a blockhead and that I'm just missing it. But he never says what I'm missing. What am I missing? How have I been wrong so far? How, I, how have I been incorrect so far? All right, anyway, let me just jump to Romans 11 real quick. The context there is this, Paul saying, I, I wish myself accursed if my brethren would just be saved, if they would just come to believe as I do. Who were his brethren? Paul was a Jew. He's talking about the Jews, those from the tribe of Judah, those who had the temple system, those to whom God was still married to, the 10 northern tribes he had divorced, right? So those are called the Gentiles very often in the New Testament because they lived among the Gentiles. They acted like Gentiles. For all intents and purposes, they had become foreigners, like foreigners. So they're addressed as Gentiles, often in the New Testament. I totally agree with that. In Romans chapter 11, here's what Paul's saying. Let me, let me paraphrase it and wrap it up. And this was part of what this guy was addressing from the other guy who wrote the article debunking I.O. The I.O. proponent was supposedly debunking that article, and they were doing it over a passage in Romans 11. The context there, and to paraphrase it, is all Paul is saying there is this. All Israel eventually will be saved. 
Ten northern tribes and the tribe of Judah. But right now what's going on, Paul is saying, is that the Jews by and large are rejecting. But these Gentiles, these diaspora, I'm going to call them that from now on, these scattered Israelites are coming in. That's why Peter was writing to them. That's why Paul is writing to them in Ephesians. That's why in Corinthians he says, our fathers passed through the sea, right? Because they were Israelites and they were worshiping idols and living among foreigners and living like foreigners. And then they were coming home to God via Christ. So Paul's addressing them. Peter's addressing them to the scattered, right? First Peter chapter one, verse one, I believe. So I agree with this guy on all of that. There's no... No division here, no squabble, no quarrel. But what he can't see is that foreigners could be a part of Israel. Yet he says he does see it. But then he ignores it and acts if it's as if that were never possible. We just saw in Acts 13. Clear as a bell. Right? So Paul is saying, right now the Jews are rejecting my people, right? My tribe. But these diaspora are coming in. The Gentiles. And they're hopefully they're making the Jews jealous for Messiah. That's what Paul is hoping. And he says, but there'll come a time when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Remember, there was a time period, a time limit given for the gospel. Forty years. Jesus said, I will be with you until the end of the age. There was a 40-year space of time given for the gospel to go out into the world of that day, giving the Israelites an opportunity, along with their proselytes, their converts, to come out of the old system and prepare themselves for the coming of the new. That's all that's happening here. That's the heartbeat of the New Testament. Something's coming, something's coming, something's coming, get ready. Now, this guy brings up constantly Matthew 24, 14 and says, what don't you get? This gospel of the kingdom, right? The new and coming kingdom that had not yet arrived until AD 70. This gospel of the kingdom will go into all the world of Judaism, right? That's the world. I've said this before. I'll say it again. Jesus said, I preached to the world. John chapter 18. I went into the synagogues. I went into the temple. That's the world. The Jews. He says, uh, the Pharisees say, after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and a whole multitude began following him after that miracle, after that sign, they look at Jesus and the crowd and they say, look, the whole world is going out after him. Who's the world? The Jews. The world that Paul says over and again was passing away. So Jesus says, in context of Matthew 24, where he says this temple is going to be destroyed, this whole complex This material temple complex is going to be destroyed. Not one stone is going to be left upon another. He says, they say, well, when will the end of this age be? They understood, the disciples, that the end of that old covenant age would be at the time of the destruction of the temple complex. That's AD 70. So Jesus says, this gospel of come out from the old system before it's gone, this gospel will be preached to all the Jews and then the end will of that old covenant system will come. Not the end of the new kingdom that hadn't even arrived yet. Okay? So that that's that with the Matthew 24. But this guy brings it up constantly saying the end would come. See? It's all over. Everything's over. No. The old covenant system was over and the eternal new covenant system had just begun. And it began with the 144,000 who were the founding fathers of it. Because they were, the, they, the 10 northern tribes, joined with the Jews, joined with proselytes who put their faith in Messiah Jesus and came through the great tribulation. The overcomers who didn't apostatize from Christ or fall away, they made it. They made it to AD 70 without perishing as one of the apostates. Now what's left? Only the new Jerusalem, only the new kingdom. And then they go out, just like in Matthew 22 in the parable, the city is burned, those who persecuted Messiah's followers are destroyed, and then they go out into the highways and the byways with the message. Is it the same message as before? Come out from the old covenant system so that you won't perish in AD 70? No, that's over. 
What do you want to call that new message? Call it whatever you want. But a new kingdom had arrived. And when you're inviting someone into that faith in God, in the new Jerusalem, call that whatever you want. Give it a name if you want. What was the name of the old covenant system? When a foreigner came along and said, you know what? I really dig what you Israelites do and I dig your God. And I want to be a part of this whole system. What was that message called? What was that gospel? Let's not get bogged down in nomenclature, in terminology. Let's stick to the main point. Whatever you want to call it, there was an invitation before the city was destroyed, and there's an invitation after the city was destroyed. You can't hide that away. You can't, you can't clip it out of the Bible with your scissors. It's there. And the explanations that you give for it are weak. I'm sorry, but they are. So there, we've talked about the 144,000. We've talked about the end of Matthew 24, 14. We've talked about Cornelius being one of the proselytes, one of the converts, one of the God-fearers. No problem there at all. Right? Now, if he was among the... Uh, he was living among the foreigners and he wasn't circumcised, then Peter says, I'm not going among him. He's not circumcised. Right? Right? And they were converting those diaspora saints, if you will, when they came into the kingdom. They were converting. They were making them Jews first. And that got all of a big mishmash. They had the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, I think it is. They were trying to figure all that out. What do we do? Nevertheless, that's all that's going on there. This guy brings up constantly, Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. His sheep were Israel, only Israel would know his voice, that's it. Yeah, but that's the same thing we're talking about over and over again here. Proselytes, converts, became the sheep, along with the house of Israel. Then when that system ended and the new system began, there's no longer any Jew, no longer any Gentile, diaspora. There's no longer, right, slave, free, barbarian, Scythian, foreigner. So there's no longer any C in Revelation 21. What's the point of all that? Listen, here it is in a nutshell. In the new kingdom, all of those distinctions would be gone. National, ethnic, genetic children of Abraham were only the peculiar people of God, the covenant people of God, for a temporary period of time. Daniel knew it, the prophecy in Daniel. Watch, let's, let's turn to it. When that period of time was up, something new began. It's that simple. Something new began. Daniel, chapter 9. Watch this. 70 weeks, 490 years, have been decreed for your people, Israel. Daniel, 490 years left for them to exist as the covenant people of God. And your holy city, Jerusalem, which was destroyed 490 years later. Excuse me. To finish the transgression. What's the transgression? The law violations of the corporate body of Israel, the nation. We're going to wrap that up. We're going to take away those sins so that we can end that old system. And that those who were in that old system can start clean again in the new. But first those sins have to be taken away. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. He fulfilled this to make an end of transgression, to make an end of sin, the corporate national body of Israel's sin, to make atonement for their iniquity. That's what Jesus did. To bring in everlasting righteousness. That's the 144,000 who began the new Jerusalem. And now in the New Jerusalem, there are none of those divisions anymore. You didn't have to be a child of Abraham. None of that mattered anymore. It's that simple. Watch this. To bring, up, to bring in everlasting righteousness, that's the new covenant. So this is simply saying 490 years given to do away with the old covenant system, the temporary system, and to do away with that and to bring in the new the everlasting righteousness, the everlasting kingdom, the kingdom that would have no end. Ephesians chapter 3, the church that would go on from age to age to age, generation after generation. 
and to anoint the most holy place. Some translations don't have the word place in there. To anoint the most holy. I see this as, however you want to look at the language, this is the induction, the inauguration of the new covenant. Look here at uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory, the praise, the doxa, right, in the church, right, and in Christ Jesus, in other words, God gets glory eternally from the church and from Christ. He turned the kingdom over to the Father. No one comes to the Father but by me, Jesus said. I go to my Father's house to prepare a place for you. It's my Father's house. There's a time coming when we won't worship my Father in this temple or in that temple. It's about the Father in the new kingdom. Right? Watch this. Now to him who was able to do, but we read that. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations for age upon age upon age. That's a, a time word. Are they counting 40 years, generations? Are they counting age upon age upon age in an invisible realm somewhere? I don't think so. Turn to Isaiah chapter 34. Isaiah 34, 17. Talking about, of course, the Israelites' uh, Babylonian captivity, I believe here. Watch this. And it says, God cast a lot for Israel, and his hand has divided it to them by line. Watch this. Then they shall possess, possess it forever. From generation to generation they will dwell in the land. Same words here. Generation to generation. Same as Ephesians chapter 3. God saying, when I bring you out of captivity... I'll bring you back to your holy land, to your holy city, and you'll live there from generation to generation. Were they taken out of captivity and brought into an invisible realm somewhere to live for generation after generation after generation? No. Paul's saying the same thing about the church. We're coming out of Babylonian captivity too. That's why apostate Judah is called Babylon in the book of Revelation because they were coming out from it into their own new kingdom, into their own new holy land, the new covenant community. That's the resurrection from the dead of Ezekiel 37. That's the adoption. That's the marriage. That's the whole kit and caboodle. That's everything they were waiting for. That didn't end. Two kingdoms didn't end simultaneously in AD 70. The old covenant kingdom ended. The new covenant kingdom came down and ended. It came down and closed. No, it doesn't work. The fullness of the Gentiles was the diaspora, those who would be saved, rescued out from the old covenant system. That's the fullness of the Gentiles. And at the time when the last one of those came in, before AD 70, all Israel would be saved. Jews and the scattered diaspora. That's all that's saying. Here's something else to ponder. Paul says in Ephesians 3 that the church would go on age upon age, age upon age, generation after generation, to all generations, right? Watch this. Doesn't what I'm about to say just dovetail perfectly with that? He says that the church would go on age upon age. Now watch this. Paul writes to Titus and Timothy, and the latest scholarship dates those writings, those letters, to A.D. 67. They know that from the book of Acts. They put all the pieces together and they say Titus, Timothy, AD 67. In those letters, Paul tells those leaders, those church leaders, Titus, Timothy, to appoint elders in all the churches and to set apart men who could teach young men the truths, right, of the kingdom so that they could teach younger men. Now let me ask you this. Why in the world, if that was written in A.D. 67, a year after the Jewish-Roman War had begun, 
Why would Paul be telling them to appoint elders in the churches and find older men, elders, who could train up younger men? Why? The war had already started. It's all going down. Shouldn't Paul have been writing to them and saying, look, forget all the church stuff. Don't worry about your elders and your church polity and any of that anymore. Look, the war started. We're going to be whisked away off the planet soon. And we're going to be in an eternal kingdom, shut away, a new Jerusalem, shut away in an invisible realm. And no one else can ever be allowed in. So forget this earthly church on the planet. Who cares about that? The time's come. It's going to be over soon. It doesn't work, folks. The car isn't blue, it's red. And you can say the car is blue all you want. And you can mock those who say the car is red. But what I've laid out here today is pretty strong evidence, as far as I can tell. If it's not, then I'm open to correction. So instead of making fun of me, instead of calling me names, instead of posting my face on your YouTube channel with somebody spanking me in the butt and doing all that kind of juvenile third grade, those antics. Why don't you just say, Frank, let me address your points one by one. Firstly, what you said about the 144,000 is invalid. Proselytes and converts could not be a part of them because, and then lay it out for me. Why can't you say that the end that came in Matthew 24, 14 was the end of everything? And let me show you how that bears out. I've already agreed with you that that gospel message of the coming kingdom ended, the Great Commission ended in AD 70 because that was a message to come out from the old before it was gone and before you perished in it, like over a million people perished in it, like the priests and many of the, the, the leaders of apostate Judaism actually burned to death and were run through with the sword and the spear or taken captive, sold off into slavery. And, when, and those who were left alive, most of them still rejected Messiah and formed some other mutant form of Judaism after AD 70. Their hearts remained hard. What else can I say here? Show me, please, clearly, without jeering words and insults. Just show me where I'm wrong. Show me how Acts chapter 13... And the God-fearers who were sitting there with the children of Abraham. They were distinct from the children of Abraham. Show me how they were the children of Abraham. Show me how those God-fearers were the men of Israel. When, he, when Paul says, men of Israel and you who fear God. Men of Israel, children of Abraham, and you who fear God. They became Israel in the sense that they converted, but they did not have the blood of Abraham in their veins. They were not part of the genetic 12 tribes. But they were considered part of Israel in the sense that they were there in the synagogue, worshiping the God of Israel, counted among them as legitimate Israelites, converts, proselytes. And they would have been part of that 144,000. That's a symbolic number for all of the dispersed, including the tribes of Judah, who came out of the tribulation. Where have I gone wrong there? What did I say wrong about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in as the diaspora people to make the Jews jealous? And then all Israel would be saved when that 40-year time limit was up. What did I say wrong there? What's incorrect about that? What's incorrect about the Ephesians passage? not being similar to the Isaiah passage. Generations, age upon age, that the church would go on. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you guys for watching today. I'll see you next time.